Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. My guest today is William J. Federer, a nationally known speaker, best-selling author, and president of AmeriSearch. His book, America's God and Country Encyclopedia of Quotations, has sold over half a million copies, and his American Minute radio feature, recalling events of American significance on the date they occurred, is broadcast nationally on radio and television. They are also read by thousands via the internet. Bill Federer, welcome to Conversation. Well, Thank you. Great to be much. with you. Um, you. You just keep writing books. How many books have you written now? It's about 20, and uh, I'm excited about a new one that I did with my wife. Uh, it's actually called Miracles in American History, and it's a collection of 32 stories of amazing answers to prayer in times in America's past where there were crises and uh, people with faith and courage rose up and things turned around. Before we get to that, can I just ask you, what's the process? How do you, you know, when uh, cranking out 20 books is a monumental task. Cranking out one book can be a monumental task. What's the process? How do you do that? Well, um, it's sort of like a lump of clay. You just keep working at it. And I have different files with different books. And I work on one for a little while, then work on another. But I, I send out a daily email. And it's called American Minute, and it's mm -hmm. something that happened on each date in American history. People mm -hmm. can sign up for it at AmericanMinute.com. Uh, and then what I did with this book with my wife is we collected 32 of the uh, most amazing ones of those American Minutes, and we developed those into chapters. And so that's how that book started. And um, where do you do your research? I mean, do you read other people's material, like old old text or where, where does that come yeah, from? Yeah, uh, I used to go to the libraries uh, when I wrote my first book, uh, America's God and Country. And uh, I remember when um, I would go to major university libraries. I was gonna say, you need a good reference library, don't you? And uh, they even had climate controlled rooms and they mm -hmm. would have these 1700, you know, 1800 year books uh, and uh, the Kentucky Blue, or Connecticut Blue Laws and, you know, the original, uh, papers of the presidents and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, anyway, um, they make you wear those little gloves. Did not that far, but I have been in some of those. Uh, there's a library actually in St. Louis, uh, the Mercantile Library. I think it's at Umsel now. I know. I mean, th whatever comes off of our skin can be really deadly yeah, to and, those and old. And that that particular library, you have to get uh, someone that works there, and they put on the gloves, and it is temperature and climate and humidity controlled, and they put it on these. Um, uh, sort of a V-shaped thing, so a lot of the old books, if you open up the binding the whole way, it'll crack it. Right. And so it sort of keeps it, and, and so yeah, I've been in those. But uh, nowadays, there's so much on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's the Avalon project that Yale did, and it's all of the charters and original sources for the colonies, and you can search them online. And So I've read through thousands of these documents, and I would excerpt out uh, things that were interesting and applicable to my different stories and but uh, for example one of these stories is in uh, 1746 now there was the war of jenkins ear you think of the war of jenkins ear well around 1731 um, england and spain spain had been the world dominating power and england and the french and the dutch were encroaching on it mm -hmm. and so a spanish ship captures a british ship cuts off the british captain's ear and says take this to your king Talk about starting a war. And so the guy, Robert Jenkins, shows up with the king, says, here's my ear that the guy chopped off. And so that started the War of Jenkins' Ear. And this was sort of interesting because the British decided they're going to use this to attack Spanish ports in Panama and in Colombia. And so there was a Admiral Edward Vernon that is sailing to Panama to capture uh, Portobello. And on his ship is George Washington's older brother. And uh, hmm. anyway, after, and then they try to take Cartagena, Columbia, and they fail. But um, when they captured Portobello in Panama, uh, Edward Vernon was like the most popular name within the British Empire. And so that's when George Washington uh, inherits his brother's estate and he names the estate after Edward Vernon. And today it's called Mount, Mount Vernon. Vernon. 
So Mount Vernon was named after the admiral during the War of Jenkins here. Anyway, uh, so the Spanish and the French were attacking ports. And uh, the British decided they were going to take a French port called Louisbourg, Nova Scotia, up by Canada. Oh, I know that spot. The Been it, there. And it was the third most uh, popular port in America after Boston, Philadelphia. And uh, it was uh, the second biggest um, city that the French had after Quebec. Mm -hmm. So Louisbourg, Nova Scotia. And um, we had the governor, William Shirley of Massachusetts, goes up and conquers it. And the French won it back. And so now we're up to the year 1746. And the French put together an armada. It's the largest navy of the era. And it has 73 huge ships, 13,000 troops. Takes them a couple of years to build all this. Word gets across that they're going to come to America with the instructions to take back Lewisburg, Nova Scotia, and then lay waste to every British town from Boston to Philadelphia to Georgia, all the way to the West Indies. And so the admiral is Admiral de Anville. He sets sail. And in Massachusetts, in Boston, Governor William Shirley declares a day of fasting and prayer. And they gather in the Old South Meeting House. And the pastor's name was Thomas Prince. And he prays, send thy tempest, Lord, upon the water, scatter the ships of our tormentors. When he finishes praying, the sky darkens, the winds begin to shriek. The church bell rings a wild and uneven sound, though no man is in the steeple. Well, lo and behold, a hurricane stirs up, smashes into the French fleet. Lightning strikes their gunpowder magazines and blows them up. Uh, they're de destroyed and trashed from Canada to the Caribbean. And 2,000 of the French troops are killed. 4,000 are sick with typhoid. Some of the ships go back to, to France. Some of them wind up at Nova Scotia. The vice admiral finds out that the admiral's dead. So the vice admiral throws himself on his sword. Right? He misses. It takes him about three days to die. And um, uh, this um, was memorialized in a poem that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow had written. It's called The Ballad of the French Fleet. And it says, Admiral de Anville had sworn by cross and crown to ravage with fire and steel our helpless Boston town. From mouth to mouth spread tidings of dismay. I stood in the old South Church saying, humbly, let us pray. O Lord, we would not advise, but if in thy providence a tempest should arise and drive the French fleet hence, and scatter it far or wide, or sink it in the sea, we should be satisfied, and thine the glory be. He said, like a potter's vessel broke, the great ships of the line were carried away as smoke, or sank in the brine. And there in Lewisburg is a plaque where it talks about this huge crusade and the typhoid, and it says, because of this and the storm, it was an utter failure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we could have all been conquered then, but this little miracle in American history was there to save us. Now, only 50 or 60 years before that in 1688, something very... 1588. 1580. No, it's 150 years before. Right. Same thing happens. The Spanish come over to conquer England, storm in the channel, boom. Right. Yeah. The Spanish in 1571 defeat the Ottoman Navy called the Battle of Lepanto, biggest battle, last battle ever done with rowing vessels. And it, he, um, Spain defeats the Muslims. Well, 1571, instead of taking back the Mediterranean from the Muslims, Spain takes their armada and decides to take back England, which had experienced the Reformation. And so in 1588... They didn't like Elizabeth. Was, yeah. That's the big deal. And so they um, uh, have uh, these ships, they're about to take 30,000 troops, more right. or less, from, you know, Spanish Netherlands over to, to England. And uh, um, Francis Drake has his smaller ships, and he's attacking them. And then uh, Francis Drake sets some ships on fire at nighttime, and they float into where the Spanish ships are anchored. And the Spanish ships have to cut their anchors and just sort of float. And then a hurricane hits and scatters these Spanish ships, and they're smashed on Scotland and Ireland and the coast. And anyway, so that destroys the Spanish Armada. But yes, it's very similar to the 1588 uh, battle. And then this is the 1746 one with the French. But one other one, I mean, there's 32 stories, but one other one is worth noting, the War of 1812. So you have the British defeat Napoleon's navy at the Battle of Trafalgar. And now the British are the most powerful navy in the world. 
the British decide in the War of 1812 they're going to take back America. So they send a fleet to Lake Erie. And uh, Robert Barclay, the one-armed British captain who fought Napoleon, I mean, this guy's tough. He's got his six big ships, and he has long-range firepower, and he smashes 28-year-old Oliver Hazard Perry's uh, flagship, the Lawrence. Um, and Oliver Hazard Perry gets on a rowboat with his sailors, and uh, they were, a lot of them were freed blacks, right? And he rows to his second ship, the Niagara. The wind changes directions. And Oliver Hazard Perry, in 15 minutes, sails directly in front of all six of the British ships, firing his cannons like a madman. And when he gets to the other side, the smoke clears. He had disabled the entire squad. Never before had an entire British squadron been disabled at one time. And so this, and, and he says, the prayers of my wife have been answered. And then he sends a letter to the Secretary of Navy saying, by the, you know, God, you know, providentially, you know, give, gave us this victory. And, um, uh, and he said, six British ships have surrendered to my force of arms after a sharp conflict. Well, this allowed America to take back Detroit, Michigan, and all of this Northwest Territory and the Battle of Tecumseh and so forth. That was part of the War of 1812. Now, they also, the British sent a fleet to New Orleans, and that is where uh, Andrew Jackson uh, had 10,000 British charging at him and had this abandoned canal that he set up and the, the fog was so thick the British were sneaking up on the Americans. Right before the British got there, the fog lifts, the Americans see him and they mow him down. They kill the, the captains and so there's you know, thousands of these British soldiers. They don't know if they're supposed to retreat or attack. All their captains are gone. And uh, 2,000 British are dead, only eight Americans. And this amazing victory... Um, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson credits to the all-powerful hand of Providence. But during this time, 4,500 British troops under um, uh, another Admiral uh, Cockburn uh, lands, and he is marching toward Washington, D.C. And uh, Admiral George Cockburn is coming into Washington, D.C., while Dolly Madison takes the picture of George Washington off the mantle of the fireplace, and she's riding out of town on a carriage. Admiral Cockburn gets to the White House goes inside, sees they're about to have dinner, sits down, eats dinner, and then torches the place. And then he goes over to the Capitol building, has his soldiers sit in the chairs of our congressmen. And then he goes to the speaker chair and he says, has a mock Congress, who votes to burn the Capitol? They all say, I, and they burn our Capitol. Then he burns the Library of Congress and the Patent Office and the Treasury and the Navy Yard. And then the sky begins to darken again and tornadoes touch down, pick up British cannons, scatter them yards away, knock down chimneys and roofs on the British soldiers, slaps horse and rider to the ground. And Admiral George Cockburn exclaimed to some bystander lady, he said, great God, Madame, is this the kind of storm you have in this infernal country? And she said, no, sir, this is a special interposition of providence to drive our enemies from our city. <laughs> well, the British flee the city in confusion. One British historian said more British were killed by this stroke of nature than by all the arms the Americans could muster in the feeble defense of their capital. This is August 25th, 1814. The British go back. Two of their ships were blown ashore. There were trees that were over those roads. They couldn't get back. And then they decide to attack Baltimore, the third biggest city in America, that storm system goes over Baltimore, and Fort McHenry is an earthen fort, right? It's where they pile up the dirt, and then they got the walls and the cannons. And so the storm piles down. The British fire 1,800 cannonballs in a 25-hour period, but most of them sink in the mud because the rains had softened the soil. And that's when September 14th of 1814, Francis Scott Key sees the flag still raving, writes the Star Spangled Banner. And then it was right after that, that President James Madison declares a day of fasting and prayer to Almighty God. And so what happens next is Napoleon escapes from the island of Elba and he goes back into Europe and so Britain has to recall every troop they have in America to get back and fight the Battle of Waterloo. Now we're talking, we got 4,500 British troops here. Waterloo, there's 50,000 British, 50,000 French. We're talking 100,000 soldiers. I mean, it is, it makes what happened in America seem like child's play. If Napoleon had, not done, that. Right. had not done that, the British would have been able to focus all their firepower on us and we would have been recaptured. 
So anyway, just a little miracle in American history, and uh, it's uh, fascinating. It's, and this is in the book called Miracles in American History, uh, the 32 amazing stories of answered prayer in our past. And there have been many. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on and on about that book, or I've got a couple other books if you want to. Yeah, let's move on to... Uh... Well, this is a, a book called Change to Chains, and it's a 6,000-year overview of world history. It's a 6,000-year quest for global control. You think, global control, what's that? Well, um, you know you have a digitized picture on your computer, and you're zoomed in really close, and all you see is the colored squares, and you can't recognize what you're looking at. But if you click zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, until pretty soon you recognize it's a face, and you can see, oh, I know that person. Well, if you see the day-to-day -day news, it's hard to see, well, what direction are we going? Should we have another stimulus bill? Should we get more? Should we do this Obamacare? We... But if we click zoom out, zoom out, zoom out, and we look at all of human history, we get to see focus. We get to recognize what's happening. So the original oldest human records appear about three or 4,000 BC. So we're talking Egyptian hieroglyphics, Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets. These are the oldest human records. Writing was invented around 3,000 BC. If you go to, the, I was just in Berlin and we went to the Pergamum Museum where they actually have the big temple of Pergamum, you know, there they have the Ishtar Gate mm -hmm. from 600 BC from Babylon. The German archeologist got it. And, you know, the Arabs didn't care about that stuff, and so they sold it. So they rebuilt this inside. You know, it's this huge blue uh, baked bricks, you know, with lions on them. So in this Berlin Museum, it says writing was invented around 3000 BC. And so they have these cuneiform cylinders from Sumeria and Sargon, and they would make the little markings on them and then, you know, roll them out on the clay, and you could see. So we see that 4000 BC. 2000 AD, roughly, roughly there's 6,000 years of recorded human history. Now, 6,000 years is not that long. It's only around 60 people living 100 years each back to back. Let me say that again So 60 people living 100 years each back to back. Mm -hmm. And you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. We're talking 60 grandmas, right? <laughs> you know, it's not that long. 60 people living 100 years each. So, what is the most common form of government in all of these 60 centuries? Dictatorship. Dictatorship, right? Monarchy. Power gravitates into the hands of one person. And so in the book, I list century by century by century. You got Sargon of Acadia, Hammurabi, you got Tilgath Pilaster of Assyria, you got Ramses the Great, uh, you got Alexander the Great, Cyrus of Persia, you got, you know, Julius Caesar and Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan. No, but what, pick whatever century you want. The history is written by dictators. And so I believe it goes back to the fall in the garden and Cain, Kill, and Abel. And it's this desire to take one kingdom from another king. And it's this selfishness that's in the human DNA. So you put some babies in a crib, one of them will wind up taking the rattle from the others. Put some kids on a playground, one of them will wind up being the bully hogging the ball. Drop some people in the woods, one of them winds up being the Indian chief, and drop them in an inner city, one of them winds up being the gang leader. So it's sort of like the Lord of the Rings. Everybody wants that ring of power. Now, if you're friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. So right. for most of world history, equality was how close of an orbit can you get to this really important person, the king. And again, the, the goes, we call them by different names, Caesars, Pharaohs, Kaisers, Sultans, Tsars, but the same function. One person basically calls the shots. And so what's rare in history, what's the dandelion sprouting through the crack in the pavement, what's rare is people getting a chance, an Self, experiment to rule themselves. Right, self-government. That is the real unusual, you comb through history, those things are really rare. The first instance of a nation being ruled without a king the first well-recorded instance is Israel, right? They come out of Egypt where the Pharaoh controlled everything and the Pharaoh owned all the land and the Pharaoh owned all the crops. Well, these Israelites come into the promised land and what's the first thing they do? Is they divide up the land amongst the people. And uh, it's sort of interesting. This is the first recorded instance of private land ownership. And so if you can own land, you can accumulate sheep and crop and cattle and be in a position to lend and not have to borrow. And the Bible called that being blessed. 
Karl Marx called it being a capitalist. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so the idea of taking the capital away from the people and you're putting it back into the hands of the government and, um, and ruled by one dictator. Now, it's also interesting, Israel was the first instance of the concept of equality. The law, everyone was equal before the law. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, even if you're a stranger living amongst them, you're under the same law. See, in, in Islam, if you're a stranger, if you're a non-Muslim, you are a dhimmi. You are a second-class citizen that can't even give testimony in court against a Muslim, right? There's no Well, the Jewish law, even the stranger living amongst them, was equal before this law. And uh, anyway, after 200 years, they got lazy and they said, we want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. king. Right. And then I go through Athens. Uh, around 600 to 300 BC, Athens had a democracy, started by a guy named Solon, S-O-L-O-N. And so Solon set up this democracy and left town. So the people had to do this. And they had uh, to go every day to the marketplace and talk politics. In Athens, if you did not keep up with politics every day, you were called an idiot. idiot. <laughs> yes, which comes to idiot. Right. Yeah. And, and then this was interesting. If there's a king and you have an agenda, you lobby the king. Like the Chinese emperors, right? There were 18 major Chinese dynasties over 5,000 years. And they would have mandarins, these eunuchs that would keep the harem and so forth. And if you wanted to get in to see the emperor, you had to bribe these guys with all kinds of favors just to get access. And so in Athens, they had no king. The people were the king. So how do you lobby and push your agenda to the whole people? Theater. That's when theater was invented. We think theater is, oh, this is, um, you know, they didn't have TV and they wanted to just have entertainment. No, it was all political. Comedies, tragedies, they would make fun of some points of view and they would extol others. And so from that time till now, theater has always been political. It's always pushed. Somebody's writing the scripts. Somebody's paying the people to write the script. Somebody owns the network. Somebody has an agenda that's being filtered out. They even let people out of jail to come to see the plays. Yeah, and, and uh, Pericles in Athens uh, made it so that poor people didn't have to pay to see the plays, right? Because the idea was you want to indoctrinate people, you wanted, so you wanted to get there. Um, well, what happened? to Athens. There was a philosopher that lived during the Athenian democracy named Plato. And he witnessed the democracy and said it's chaos, it's mobocracy. It's, uh, you know, his mentor was Socrates and he was speaking out against the government and this government voted to tell Socrates he has to die. And he, you know, so he drinks hemlock and so forth. And Plato's like, I don't like this democracy. Plato said a city government would go through five stages. He said the first stage is rule of the capable. These are people that know how to run farms and businesses and they know how to run city governments. They're just responsible. They're followed by what he called lovers of fame. These are people that have no experience running anything. They just want to get, be in front, get their 15 minutes of attention. In other words, they're like maybe a Hollywood actor that gets elected governor of California. I mean, you know, sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, what, what did the, he, he run before he became governor? Really nothing. He was just famous. So Plato said you go from rule of the capable to rule of the famous. Now, these famous people yield to what Plato called the natural human drive of avarice or selfishness. And so they use their position to vote themselves favors and vote their family favors and vote their friends favors. And they use this pot of city money to dole out to their supporters, right? And so it turns into an insider clique that Plato called an oligarchy, a rule of few. And so we go from rule of the capable, rule of the famous, to this oligarchy. The people get upset at the oligarchy, decide to vote the bums out, and they set up a democracy. This is great. The people get to determine their own fate. But the people have no experience running a city government. They have that same selfish nature, that avarice, and they see there's a pot of city money, treasury sitting there, and they said, you mean we can just vote and we can spread all this wealth around? Well, yeah, let's vote to do it. They spread the wealth around, there's no more money left. Then they say, well, where's the money? Uh, the rich people, they got the money. You mean we can just vote to take the money from the rich people? Yeah, so they vote, they take it away. Then there's no rich people left. And then they still want to get money, right? They're addicted to it. And so they begin to bicker amongst themselves. Well, don't touch my stash. Well, there's not enough for me. Well, don't take mine. And it begins to devolve into anarchy and chaos. And then they begin to say, 
Can't someone come along and fix this mess? And then Plato says this is the fifth stage. Someone comes along and he's all smiles and he promises everything to everybody. But then he begins to consolidate his power and begins to say, oh, trust me with your money, with your rights, with your freedoms, with your, and it begins to, and then he says, he begins to falsely accuse his opponents and then gather them away and kill them. And the next thing you know, Plato says, this guy stands in the chariot of state holding the reins of power and the protector turns into the tyrant. Mm -hmm. And so he says, democracy without virtue and self-control always ends in chaos and anarchy out of which a tyrant arises. So we go from rule of the capable, rule of the famous, an oligarchy, rule of the few, to a democracy, to a tyranny. We've got about two or three minutes left here. Uh, this sounds all too familiar down to our, very, uh, down to our day today. And uh, I, I find it rather scary what's going on uh, in, in Western culture right now because we seem to be going, we've already gone through the capable. <laughs> well, the, yeah. well, in the book, I, I hint that I'm working on another volume of philosophers that wanted to take the separated power and reconcentrate it, right? And so we got Machiavelli, Hegel, Saul Linsky, and uh, Machiavelli lived 500 years ago in Italy. There was a bunch of city-states that always fought. Machiavelli thought if one prince could control it all, it would bring peace. So he writes a book called The Prince, where he advocated the ends justifies the means. The end of one prince, prince controlling, it's good. So this idea, if the prince conquers a city, they'd hate him. But if the prince paid some criminals to burn barns, kill cows, create crisis and terror, the people would cry out for help. The prince would come in, kill the very criminals that he bribed. Nobody would know the better for it, and they would praise the prince as a hero. So it's good marketing. You create the need and fill it. You go around the back of the house, set it on fire, and then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher, and they'll pay anything for it, and thank you for being there. It's called Machiavellianism, where you create or capitalize on a crisis to consolidate control. Sort of like Rahm Emanuel saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. Or David Axelrod, the president's campaign chairman, that says in Chicago politics, we have a tradition where you throw a brick through your own campaign office window and then call a press conference to accuse your opponent. In other words, you create the crises and blame it on the other person, and then you use that as an excuse to consolidate power. And so it's interesting how these different philosophies influenced, you know, uh, Hegel and Karl Marx and Saul Linsky. And but Lenin. to your point, when you look at the vast sweep of the 6,000 years, you see these, these things repeat over yeah, the and The norm over is dictatorship, which rare is stretching the rubber band, giving power to the people. But in times of crises, the rubber band snaps back. Very much so. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I get a little like, oh, man, I mean, this, this is our life. This is our real lives that we're talking about here. This is not some story that you've written in a book. This is about who we are, where we are right now. Well, the one hopeful thing is uh, I say that, you know, it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. It's also in times of crises that leaders rise up. And so whether it's a, a Moses or a David or a George Washington or a Lincoln, so uh, hopefully as we see crises, we can see people rise up in leadership. I hope so. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I've been speaking with Bill Federer. Um, he's written a lot of books, and he's lot, got a lot of good information here. Hopefully you've taken some notes today. Uh, you can watch this on YouTube again and uh, get this. For the rest of you, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Goodbye.